Hello brothers and sisters in Christ. Okay, I have the right to have fun, be entertained, entertainment, be entertained, and play. I have the right. Well, and a lot of the times, a lot of the videos that I've done against video games, um, against sin, oftentimes, just sin, um, people will come back with this excuse of, I have the right to have fun, and be entertained, and play. So when someone says that, you say, what say at the scriptures? Let's say at the scriptures, chapter and verse. Seems to be a lot of feelings and opinions that are going on in the comment sections when it comes to brethren out there that make videos correcting sin, rebuking those who refuse to give up sin, correcting sin. So um, some of them would even go as far as to try to justify it, like I've, I've worked eight hours a day and I do this and I have all this, look at me, I'm good. Remind me of the story of uh, the Pharisee and the publican that went up to the temple to pray. I'm not as other men are. And if you read it, he says all the bad things, but then he goes through to say, look at all these good things I do. You know, I do all these good things. I work hard. I deserve to have fun, be entertained, and play. So when someone says that, you say, what saith the scriptures? So I'm a King James Bible believer. Make sure to have your King James Bibles out. We're going to go through a lot of scriptures, which is why I'm not going to be turning because I'm slow and it takes a while. Um, so the first word we're going to start with is fun. What does the scripture say about fun? This one I was doing just for effect. No, not there. No, 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 not there. Not in the Old Testament, maybe in the New Testament. No, not there. Maybe the time of Jacob's trouble. Nope, not even there. The word fun is not in scripture. So brethren, we need to get it out of our vocabulary because the word fun is not in scripture. You can't back it up. I have the right to have fun. Where is it at in scripture? Show me chapter and verse. It's not there. The next word we talked about was being entertained, entertainment. Entertainment's the biggest word they used. I used inter entertained because that is scripture. But entertainment, once again, I can do the same thing again. Not in the Old Testament. Not when Jesus came in the likeness of sinful flesh. Not in the, what we call the church age. The New Testament, Pauline epistles. Not in Revelation, time of Jacob's trouble. It's not there. But what is in the Bible is entertain, entertained. Entertain, if I can say it without the ED. If you want to open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 13, verse 1. We're going to start there. Very hot day today. Let brotherly love continue. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Remember them that are in bonds as bound with them, and them which suffer adversities as being yourselves also in the body. Okay. What does it mean to entertain somebody? I guess the best example, and I didn't put it down there, is go to Abraham in the Old Testament sometime and read the story of you have the angel of the Lord and two other angels. Three men come walking up, and Abraham sees them and says, Come, rest your feet. Here, let me give you some water to wash your feet. Let's get some food. Quick, kill the calf. Get the food ready. We give them food. We give them a place to rest. Give them water. Okay, entertain. That's what it means to entertain. Okay, to help take care of. Okay, to go out of your way to help take care of somebody else. You're entertaining them. All right. So, uh, right there, where does it say we have the right to entertainment, as the world says? And a brother in Christ brought to my attention, if they really love their entertainment, just tell them about the Colosseum, where Christians were being killed and eaten by lions. It's just entertainment. See, entertainment's lost world. It's not Christian. Okay? You won't find it in Scripture. Entertain, we are to entertain. Do you have the right to entertain? You have, uh, to, you have not just the right, but the responsibility. Remember, Hebrews is written to what? The Jews in the time of Jacob's trouble. See, in that time period, it's going to be very, very, very important that those who get saved take care of one another. Look out for one another. Okay, it's very important in that time period. But here we get to the word play, which I found was very interesting. Play is in the Bible. 
fun, not in the Bible. Entertainment, not in the Bible. And all these comments you keep seeing people come back with that try to defend their sin, it's all feelings and opinions. They couldn't quote scripture to save their life, proving that you have the right to have fun, proving you have the right to entertainment. Now let's look at the word play, brothers and sisters in Christ. Remember, my videos are addressed to saved sinners, okay? not lost people. So this is to encourage you, brothers and sisters of Christ, that when we say something, we need to make sure it's in Scripture. I used to use the word play a lot. I used to use the word entertainment when I was lost. I really did like entertainment. Movies, TV shows, video games, porn. I like to go out to eat a lot, you know, fast food. Okay? Went and did things that were just unfruitful. Okay? I loved entertainment. Uh, movie theaters, plays, that kind of stuff. But now that I'm saved, I realize that doesn't glorify God. So let's look at the word play. Is play in the Bible? Do we have the right to play? Turn to Exodus chapter 32, verse 1. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together with Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods, lowercase t, which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what is become of him. And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. And all the people break off the golden earrings which were in their ears, and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at their hands, and fashioned it with a graving tool, after he had made it a molten calf. And, sa and they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. <laughs> Aaron's also the same guy that said, I don't know what happened. I just threw the gold in there and out popped this calf. I don't know what happened. Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Let that sink in. Okay. This is actually the second time plays mentioned. We'll mention the first time that plays mentioned in the Bible, but let that sink in. They rose up to play. They're worshiping a false god. It's flesh. It's play just seems from here, from right here, it has to do with indulging the flesh. What was going on here? You keep reading, they were getting naked. They were dancing around. They were doing all kinds of wickedness. It was all flesh. It didn't glorify God whatsoever, even though Aaron said, Hey, tomorrow there's a feast unto the Lord. No, they were worshiping a false god and doing a feast to a false god. Okay. Uh, Exodus 32, 17. Jump down to Exodus 32, 17. Another very important thing. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said unto Moses, There is a noise of war in the camp. And he said, It is not the voice of them that shout for mastery, neither is the voice of them that cry for being overcome. In other words, it's not a war in the camp. Well, then what is it? But the, mo but the noise of them that sing do I hear. And it came to pass, as soon as he came nigh into the camp, that he saw the calf and the dancing, and Moses' anger waxed hot, and he cast the tables out of his hands and brake them beneath the mount. I found that very interesting for those who have really want to defend and say that all music in the Bible is positive right there they're dancing to this music that has such a beat like drums and yelling and screaming we read there Joshua thinks there's a war in the camp uh, music isn't always spoken of positively in the Bible anybody tells you that they're lying okay Right there we see it. No, they're singing. And then Moses comes down and finds them dancing. Singing and dancing to a certain style of music that's fleshly, pagan. First right. Corinthians chapter 10, verse 7, if you want to turn there, reverts back and warns us about this. 
Okay, what's going on here? You become idle and you start giving into the flesh. Let's go play. Okay. First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 7. Neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. So in this first passage that we're reading together, is play a positive thing or is it a negative thing? It's a negative thing. Play here is referred to the flesh. It's all about feeding the flesh. Go as far as to say worshiping, idolatry, worshiping false gods. Oftentimes when people say I'm going to play this or play that, when it comes to worldly things, it's idolatry. You tell them, hey, God says that what you're doing is a sin. I ain't giving up my sin. I love my sin. It's idolatry. It's worship of a false god. Fleshly worship of a false god. Okay. Now, turn back to Genesis 38, 24. We're going to go back to the first time play is mentioned in the Bible. Okay. Let's see if it's mentioned in a positive light. We have the right to play, brothers and sisters in Christ. Let's see. Genesis 38, 24. And it came to pass about three months after that it was told Judah, saying, Tamar, thy daughter-in-law, hath played the harlot. And also, behold, she is with child by whoredom. And Judah said, Bring her forth and let her be burnt. You read the whole story there about Tamar. Okay, The older son dies, the, her husband dies, which is the eldest son. And then the next son marries her, dies, and so on and so forth. The la youngest son, he's scared to give it to her because he doesn't want his last son to die. On and on, she dresses up like a prostitute. And everything read the story but the point is is she played the harlot she pretended to be a harlot on the side of the road she was playing the harlot that's flesh she's exposed you know prostitution it's all about um, trying to get the right words it's all about the flesh hey look what I've got you want to buy this okay she was playing the harlot is play here a good thing or a bad thing? The word play used is a good way or a bad way? A bad way. A negative way. Okay. Turn to Leviticus chapter 21 verse 9. And the daughter of any priest, if she profane herself by playing the whore, she profaneth her father, she shall be burnt, burnt with fire. That's where you get that, where you're saying burn her with fire. Okay, Leviticus. So you can play the whore, you can play the harlot. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 21. We're going to see this again. Then they shall bring out the damsel to the door of her father's house. And the men of her city shall stone her with stones that she die, because she hath wrought folly in Israel. To play the whore in her father's house, so shalt thou put evil, put evil away from among you. One more, Judges chapter 19, 2. And there was a lot of them. I'm just grabbing a few just so I'm pushing my point that one of the definitions of play is you're playing a prostitute or a whore. Judges 19.2 and his concubine played the whore against him and went away from him unto her father's house to Bethlehem Judah and was there four whole months. So you see someone playing the whore again. So the word play here, is it a positive thing or is it a negative thing? Negative. You have the right to play? I'd be careful. All right. One, you're getting up and playing and it's just all flesh, not glorifying God. You're glorifying your flesh, glorifying false gods, idolatry. Now we see you're glorifying the flesh again with the word play. What's the next way play is used in the Bible? Turn to 1 Samuel chapter 16, 6. Play is used this way a lot in the Bible also. First time it's ever used positively, somewhat. 1 Samuel 16, 6. 
Let our Lord now command thy servants which are before thee to seek out a man who is cunning, who is a cunning player on a harp. And it shall come to pass, when the evil spirit from God is upon thee, that he shall play with his hand, and thou shalt be well. And Saul said unto his servants, Provide me now a man that can play well, and bring him to me. What are we seeing here? The word play is being used in relation to a harp. A musical instrument that's melody. Okay? We're going to see um, that you, when you go through the Bible, the play, it talks to mean tam tambourines. Something that is just made where you can keep time so everybody can sing together, everybody can play together as one. It's rhythm. It's to keep time. You won't see it where they're going crazy, where the rhythm's faster than the heartbeat, where people are yelling and screaming, except what we read back in uh, uh, Exodus. Turn to 1 Samuel 26. Just flip over a few chapters to 1 Samuel 26, 21. Oh, I'm sorry. Jumped ahead. 1 Samuel 18, 6. A couple chapters over, but now people are probably turning back. 1 Samuel 18, 6. And it came to pass, as they came, when David was returned from the slaughter of the Philistines, that the women came out of all the cities of Israel, singing and dancing, to meet King Saul with tabrets, with joy, and with instruments of music. And the women answered one another as they played, and said... Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. What does played mean there? The instruments. Okay? There's nothing wrong with the instruments. The word play when it comes to playing a musical instrument for the Lord. Now, what's another way play was used in the Bible? So that's so far, that's the only positive thing. Do you have the right to play? Instruments, godly instruments, that's melody that brings glory to God and doesn't please your flesh, absolutely. But what's another way the word Bible uses the word play? 1 Samuel chapter 21, verse 12. And David laid up these words in his heart and was sore afraid of Achish, the king of Gath, and he changed his behavior before him and feigned himself mad in their hands and scrabbled on the door of the gates, and let his spittle fall down upon his beard. Then said Achish unto his servants, Lo, ye see the man is mad. Wherefore then have ye brought him to me? Have I need of a madman, that ye, may, that ye have brought this fellow to play the madman in my presence? Shall this fellow come into my house? King David was putting on a show, and look at it, it was fleshly. He was playing the madman. It was all flesh. And it was, de it was done to deceive. Okay. So we see here, you can play something that's deceptive. You can play the madman. Okay. 1 Samuel chapter 26, verse 21. 1 Samuel 26, 21. Then said Saul, I have sinned. Return, my son David, for I will not more do thee harm, because my soul was precious in thine eyes this day. Behold, I have played the fool and have erred exceedingly. I don't know if you heard that. The chickens are going a little crazy. But he had played the fool, Saul. Past tense. Is this a positive thing? Is it a good thing to play the fool? No. I understand that King David did what he did, but is it a good thing to play the madman? You know, but the whole point is play there. Is it a reference to something that's good and holy? Something you can give God glory in and give him thanks for? Or is it something referred to something that's fleshly? He played the fool. The Bible talks a lot about the fool. The fool said in his heart, there is no God. All right? It's all about the flesh. They were, why do people reject God? For the flesh. Mm -hmm. Now, another way a play has been used in the Bible. Turn to 2 Samuel chapter 2, verse 12. And Abner the son of Ner and the servants of Ishaboleth the son of Saul went out from Mahanium 
to Gibeon. And Joab the son of Zerai and the servants of David went out and met together by the pool of Gibeon. And they sat down, the one on the other side of the pool and the other on the other side of the pool. And Abner said to Joab, Let the young men now rise and play before us. This sounds pretty positive. They're going to rise and they're going to just play, you know. Let's keep reading. And Joab said, Let them arise. Then they arose and went over by number twelve of Benjamin, which pertained to Ishbosheth, I'm butchering names, the son of Saul, and twelve of the servants of David. And they caught every one his fellow by the head and thrust his sword in the fellow's side, so they fell down together. Wherefore they pl that place was called. You guys can try to pronounce that. Zur Zurim, the last part, which is in Gibeon. And there was a very sore battle that day. And Abner was beaten and the men of Israel before the servants of David. They were going down to play and they killed each other. Is that a good thing? You can see oftentimes play is a reference to war, fighting. Men fighting with one another. Okay. 2 Samuel chapter 10, verse 9. When Joab saw that the front of the battle was against him before and behind, he chose of all the choice men of Israel and put them in array against the Syrians. And the rest of the people he delivered into the hands of Abishai, his brother, that he might put them in array against the children of Ammon. And he said, If the Syrians be too strong for me, then thou shalt help me. But if the children of Ammon be too strong for thee, then I will come and help thee. Be of good courage, and let us play the men for our people, and for the cities of our God, and the Lord do that which seemeth him good. So we see there the word play is used once again when it comes to fighting, getting the men together to go fight. Now this one, I can't say it's good or bad. You know, they can be used bad, it can be used good. Okay. There's a time for war and there's a time for peace. Okay. Today, uh, we're supposed to be offensive spiritually, but defensive, we're supposed to be defensive spiritually and physically. You're to defend your home. You're to defend your family. Okay. You're supposed to protect the body, which is a temple for the Holy Ghost. Okay. You're supposed to protect yourself physically. Now, the last type, and if I missed one, Brother and Sister Christ, put one down there. If I missed a, a use of play, because there was lots of them, and I tried to go through all of them. Um, but the last time you see the word play is in Zacharias 8.5. Not the last time, but the last thing I saw subject-wise where it's used differently than what we've already talked about. Zechariah 8.5. And the streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in the streets thereof. People will go, well, see, there you go. That's a positive thing, right? Well, first, there's two things. When it says boys and girls, it's talking about little boys and little girls. You know, toddlers probably up to the age six, maybe age eight. It's not talking about 20-year-olds, 30-year-olds, 40-year-olds, 80-year-olds. It's not talking about them. It's talking about little kids. And what are little kids? Fleshly. They're not about work. Good work. You have to train them and teach them to be about good work. They're out there playing. Okay. Now, I'm not saying this is necessarily bad if a little child plays. No, I'm not saying it's bad at all. But I'm saying you can't grab this and say, see, we have the right to play. It's talking about little children. They go out and they start playing, throwing a ball around or something. Mm -hmm. So you see, only two times, and I'll throw this, we'll say three times, the word play is used positively, but once for children, once for music, musical instruments, and once for war, for fighting, when a war is needed. When it's not needed, it's used in a bad way. All right. So, stop there for a second. I'm going to lean forward. See what we got on the time. That's right, it doesn't show me. Nice camera. Thank you, brothers and sisters in Christ, for helping me. Those who donated to the ministry for the camera. It's an amazing camera, but 
doesn't show me the time to let me know how long we've been here. Um, but let's keep going. Do we have the right to have fun? No. Chapter and verse. Not in the Bible. Do we have the right to entertainment? No. Chapter and verse. Word entertain, and only, like I said, the word entertain only found once. Entertain strangers. All right. Take care of somebody. Uh, do we have the right to play? Well, it depends. Are you talking about musical instruments? Yes. Are you talking about war? Uh, today, not so much. If you're talking about defending yourself and protecting your family, yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Little kids playing with the ball, kicking it around, going outside, climbing trees, wandering through the streets, chasing each other like those talked about in that passage. They're playing. Is there anything wrong with that? No. But the question is, brothers and sisters in Christ, are we little kids? Are we toddlers? Little kids running around the street. People always say, why do you say little toddlers? Because you go back in the past, kids that were 12 years old were raised to be mature. They were taught how to read, write, do math, and they could run the farm. If dad was sick, dad hurt his leg, busted his leg or whatever, they could run the farm at 12 years old. And the parents could trust him. The dad could trust the son, hey. And the same thing goes with the daughter. Mom's sick or something in bed, the daughter can take over what she's doing while she's sick. And she would be trusted to do it. Nowadays, you can't even trust an 18-year-old. Hardly. Now, I'm looking at me and laughing because you couldn't trust me when I was 18. I was all about playing and entertainment and fun. You know, having a good time. It right? wasn't about responsibilities. Now, here's the thing is you're like, but they're like, we're supposed to be able to have fun. We're supposed to have, what's the Bible say? The Bible talks about having joy. Fun's not in the Bible. Joy is in the Bible. So what does the Bible talk about joy? Okay, what can we, what's the biggest thing that we can have joy in, in this life, with a physical action? Okay. Turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 24. There is nothing better for a man than that he should eat and drink, and that he should make his soul enjoy good in his labor. This also I saw that it was from the hand of God. Now some labor is going to be, be was is going to be hard work, and at the time it's not super fun. They use the word fun, not super joyful. See, even I have to start getting stuff out of my vocabulary. I was wrong for saying it. Joyful, but the fruit of your labors is joyful. Why? Why do you think I chose back here? I don't know if you can see it that much on, on this, but. Setting up all these brick flower beds, rocking this whole backyard, it was not fun. I don't know if you can get the colors just right, but he's ready to eat. Definitely going to be eating him. So, I'll set him over here. So I got onions galore that I just pull out when I need onions. I pull them out and I eat. I sit on the deck at the end of the day of a hard work and I relax. And I go over everything that I've done and I take joy in it. And I have joy. Okay, you have the right to rest. Absolutely, nobody's going to deny that when it comes to Scripture. The Bible talks about God rested on the seventh day. Okay, we are supposed to take time of rest, but we're not to let that be an excuse to let our flesh run rampant and start falling into the flesh where we get into playing and entertainment. Play in the bad way, entertainment and fun. Flesh, flesh, flesh. No, we have the right to rest and relax. Okay. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 16, if you want to turn there. The laborer of the righteous tendeth to life, the fruit of the wicked to sin. Right. You know when you do see, you know when you do not have joy in your labor during or at the end? It's because it's unfruitful. You can even say it's not that it's not unfruitful. You can say it's bad fruit. It's producing bad fruit. I'll tell you one of the things that is fun for me, and I don't do it that often, but God blessed me 
I found a really dirt cheap guy at kayak. I was borrowing a kayak from a neighbor and going out and fishing on the ocean. And people, oh, that's so much fun. I go out there and I first start out there and I'm thinking, this is going to be fun. I catch the fish and everything. And you're out there. First time I got out that kayak, my legs were numb from the waist down and I fell face, face first in the water because uh, my legs just didn't work. And then when I got home that evening, I had to clean the fish and I'm sitting there and I'm like, man, that was fun. And the next day, I was hurting. It's something I had to get used to. But the point is, is there's days I go out where it's fun and there's some days it's not fun. I don't do it, but I use the word fun again. It's not joyful. Forgive me, Lord. Forgive me, brothers and sisters of Christ. It's not joyful. Okay? I get out there. One time I went out there to go fishing, and the wind is blowing. And I'm paddling hardcore to get to that rock. There's a rock over there. The other two guys I went fishing with, because it's good to go in a group, so it's safety out on the ocean with kayaks. And they make it around that rock, and I'm just paddling, my, just nonstop paddling. I had to learn how to troll as, in a kayak as I'm paddling. If you know what trolling is, you just throw the hook in, set it in, and you just start trolling and hope something bites. And I'm just paddling really hard and I get close to that rock and that fishing pole hits and I'm like, I got a fish, I get excited, you know? I get that fish in, it falls off the hook into my lap. In other words, I didn't have to fight the hook to get out. Sometimes I gotta fight it because the, the hook hooks them in the mouth and everything in the throat. It falls into my lap and I get that thing on the stringer quick, really quick, and I look up and I'm a million miles from that rock. I spent almost an hour trying to get to that rock before I caught one fish and I'm paddling with all of my might. And then I start all over paddling because everybody's around that corner. And by the time we got home, I had three fish. We were only out there for two to three hours and I was so exhausted. That was not joyful. Right? It was painful. But when I ate fish that night, that was joyful setting out on the deck laughing with the lord that wind it was just fighting me the whole way you know some things are going to be joyful some things are not going to be joyful okay oftentimes when something's not joyful whatsoever like the uh the fruits of your labor or actual during the labor it's not joyful at all in any way shape or form chances are it's unfruitful or it's bad fruit shouldn't be doing it and I'm not talking about the flesh. That's the whole thing about joy. Fun has to do with the flesh. Joy has to do with the spirit. Mm -hmm. Maybe that'll help people distinguish the difference. Mm -hmm. Entertainment. Mm -hmm. Next one. Turn to Psalms 128, verse 1. Blessed everyone that feareth the Lord that walketh in his ways. For thou shalt eat the labor of thine hands, happy shalt thou be, and it shall be well with thee. Thy wife shall be as a fruitful vine by, thy, by the sides of thine house, thy children like olive plants round about thy table. Behold, that thus shall the man be blessed that feareth the Lord. It says here, For thou shalt eat the labor of thine hands. Once again, the joy comes when there's fruit, good fruit, at the end of that labor. Mm -hmm. That's where your joy is supposed to be at the end of the day. We read up there, there's no better, th there's nothing better for a man that he should eat and drink and that he should make his soul enjoy good in his labor. Someone says, is that all we do is just work and rest? Pretty much, that's how my days are. I enjoy reading the Bible doing work for the Lord. These are good fruits. Reading the Bible, doing Bible studies. I sit out on the deck and I talk with the Lord when I'm resting, you know. But what they're really saying is, is why can't I indulge my flesh? Why can't I just have a little sin here and there? Mm -hmm. Now, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 9. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 9. What profit hath he that worketh in that wherein he laboreth? I have seen the travail which God hath given to the sons of men to be exercised in it. He hath made everything beautiful in his time. Also he hath set the world in his heart, so that no man can find out the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. 
A lot of times things are going to happen in your life. God's going to be doing things in your life. You're not going to get it. But God's working. Don't ever doubt that God isn't working in your life. If you're truly saved, God is working in your life. If you're lost and seeking the truth, God's going to be working in your life and bring you to the truth. I'm an example. False convert brought me to the truth. I know that there is no good in them but for a man to rejoice and, do, and to do good in his life. And also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all his labor it is the gift of God. This garden, gift of God. The fruit trees, gift of God. The chicken coop that I built with help from some neighbors because they had great ideas. Uh, dealing with these chickens every day, hunting them down at night sometimes and having to catch them in the bushes. It's not always fun. It's a blessing. Why? Because the fruit of the labor, I get eggs. Okay. Um, when I go fishing to get fish, okay. whether it's at the side of the river or it's out in a kayak, it's hard work sometimes. But there's fruit. Okay. You get to enjoy that fruit. Joy is something we do have a right to have when we are in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Here's another one I found interesting, Ecclesiastes 5.12. The sleep of, the laboring, of a laboring man is sweet, whether he eat, eat little or much, but the abundance of the rich will not suffer him to sleep. In other words, bottom line, brother, says Christ, you work hard all day, you're going to get, oftentimes you'll get a good night's rest. There's some of us, I'm pointing at me, that have messed up their bodies. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. The wages of sin is death, okay? There's still consequences to my past sins when it comes to this body. This body is a fleshly, sinful body, okay? Uh, there's those of us that still have problems, but you have someone who's healthy and works all day, and you have someone who's not, who is healthy and doesn't do anything and just lays around all day, and someone else can do it. I can pay him to do it. I can pay that person to do it. I can pay this person to do it, and doesn't do any work themselves. The person who worked hard all day is going to have a good night's rest. Found that interesting, and isn't that joyful to have a good night's rest? There's a lot of people out there that they work hard. And they're like me in the same boat as me. They didn't take care of themselves when they were younger, and they wish they could have a good night's rest. It's a joyful thing. Mm -hmm. Laboring with your hands. Psalms 104, 16. The trees... Oh, oh wait a second. Turn there. The trees of the Lord are full of sap, the cedars of Lebanon which he hath planted. Where the birds make their nests, as for the stork, the fir trees are her house. The high hills are a refuge for the wild goats and the rocks for the conies. He appointed the moon for seasons, the sun knoweth his going down. Thou makest darkness, and it is night, wherein all the beasts of the forest do creep forth. The young lion roar after their prey and seek their meat from God. The sun ariseth, they gather themselves together and lay them down in their dens. Man goeth forth unto his work and to his labor unto until the evening. O Lord, how manifold are thy works! In wisdom hast thou made them all. The earth is full of thy riches. Notice it said there, work and his labor unto evening. We're in, here in America, I know I got some brothers in Christ out there. You talk to some people, it's like, we talking about eight hour days. 40 hours a week. What are you talking about? Cl store opens, I'm there. Store closes, I'm there. Six days a week. Work is work. In these other countries that I've been to, uh, work is work. They're working all day. Okay? Um, and until evening, I believe the Jewish calendar, or the days, uh, the days ended at 6 p.m. Next day started, 6 p.m. to 6 p.m. That's the next day, 6 p.m. to 6 p.m. So, at the end of the day, to the evening, okay, they worked. So, I just had to bring that up. So, some people, working all day keeps you out of trouble. And for us in America, 
don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to downplay it. You work eight hours, is that the only time you work is when you go to a job that pays you? No, we come home and there's lots of work to be done at house, around the house, things to be fixed, things to do. So I understand you guys are working more than eight hours, but the point of reading that verse is, is laboring, we're supposed to be laboring every day. Take a day of rest, absolutely. Gotta keep my eyes out. Hosea 12, 18, here's a warning. Hosea 12, 18. And Ephraim said, Yet I am become rich, I have found me out substance, and all my labors they shall find none iniquity in me that were sin. So many brethren out there keep praying that, uh, asking for prayer for jobs that aren't sinful and wicked. But here it says labor. You need to make sure it's not just jobs where you're getting paid for. You need to make sure that when you're laboring and doing things that you'll find no iniquity in it. And you, because you're doing it. A lost person do it, preach the gospel to them. Save brother and sister in Christ do it, correct them through scripture. If I'm being corrected for doing some sin in my labor, I need to, I need to realize if that labor might not be good or the way I'm doing it's not right or I shouldn't be doing it. Okay? There's not supposed to be sin and the labor, the things you do with your hands. There's supposed to be stuff that you can glorify God. Remember, we're supposed to give God glory in all things. Let he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Uh, whatever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, they're not supposed to be sinful things. You're not supposed to be laboring with sinful things. Turn to Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Talk about Jesus. Matthew eleven twenty eight. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. When we get saved, Brothers and sisters of Christ, our attitude towards work changes, our attitude towards labor changes, our attitude towards sin changes. Okay? We start doing a lot for the Lord. Just everything becomes about the Lord. Yoke comes on our neck. Jesus' burden is put on us. His burden is easy as life. And no matter how hard the day is, no matter how hard the day is, you sit down there in the evening, whether it's before bed or a little bit before bed, you sit there and you start talking with the Lord doing a Bible study, He gives you rest. He gives you peace. Mm -hmm. That's how it's supposed to be. Oftentimes when you can't find that rest and you can't find that peace, either you've destroyed your body, <laughs> I'm talking about me again, you've either destroyed your body or you're not living right and doing right. Your spirit is not right. It's, it's, it's not... It's saying, hey, something's not right. Okay. And people, I put down here, people say, get saved and there's no more fun and entertainment. I don't want to be a Christian because then I can't have fun. I can't have my entertainment. Why? Because it's not about the flesh anymore. Flesh goes bye-bye. Old man, new man, it becomes about Jesus Christ. Everything you do becomes about Jesus Christ. If Jesus came to this house, I'd be like, you want to go check out the chickens, Lord? Look at the eggs you've blessed me with. Look at these chickens you've blessed me with. You want to go work in the garden? You want to do, people always say, a Bible study. Well, uh, talk with the Lord while you're working in the garden. The whole point is, is the things that you do and the things that you labor with, would you be proud to have Jesus beside you? Or are you doing something that's like, I got to keep it quiet and hush-hush and behind closed doors and... Really, if Jesus came, that's not something I'd really ask him if he wanted to do that, you know. Then get it out of your life. Get it out of your life. Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death, for what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled 
in us. Talking about saved sinners. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things that are the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Life, laboring, working for the Lord. We have true life and joy in our lives, peace. Okay? Verse 7, because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. That's why my, what I found in the Bible, there's no such thing as a carnal Christian. It's enmity against God. And it says here, for it is not subject to the law of God. You know, you have the law of sin and death, and you have the law of God, the spirit of life, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You get saved, it's the law of God. You're lost, the law of sin and death. And it says here, for it is not subject to the law of God. Mm -hmm neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Not people who fall into sin and te uh, fall into temptation and choose to sin. I remember that study, <laughs> that brother corrected me, he's probably about to slip up and correct me again. And that's okay brother, you do that. Uh, fall into temptation and I choose to sin. This is talking about that are in the flesh. Their flesh runs them. They're still lost. Their flesh is in charge. Okay. They that are in the flesh cannot please God. It is not worth it. Anybody that's listening to this, talking to the brethren, professing Christians and actual Christians, okay, if you're professing, get saved. But I don't know if, when I say profession, I don't know who's saved and who's not as far as everybody that watches my channel. But those that are saved, and you're still holding on to things that you're not supposed to be doing, get it out of your life. Video games, not worth it. I cannot see, I've talked with some of the brethren, and all these brethren that I talked to that struggle with video games, wasted their time with video games, they can't see why anybody who's truly saved and born again would grab and hold on to video games and say, I'm not letting go of it. Give me video games over Jesus Christ. I love my video games. Uh, satanic style music. Uh, I can go through the whole list. Alcohol, cigarettes, on and on and on. Why would you do that? It's not worth it. Brethren, get it out of your life. God will get it out of your life. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. God will get it out of your life, but you've got to submit yourself to His Word and say, okay, I'm throwing them away. God, give me the strength to keep them out of my life. Turn to Luke chapter 10, 2. Going back to Jesus. Therefore said he unto them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. Here's my question, brother and sister. Why so few laborers? Today, over half the world, half the world believes in a Jesus Christ. I didn't say the Jesus Christ, a Jesus Christ. Okay? Why so few laborers? There's so many for Chris, professing Christians out there and so few laborers. Why is that? Could it be that, they, that what they are doing cannot glorify God? What I mean by that is they, they claim to be laboring for the Lord, but they're not. Why are there so few laborers out there? I believe, honestly, in these last days, there's fewer and fewer Christians out there. There are people that are falling away, and what I believe as far as falling away is, is yeah, they can turn against the major doctrines in the sense that, well, I still believe the major doctrine here, but they become where we can agree to disagree, and I can get along with people who go against the major doctrines. Go, I believe the gospel here, but if you didn't repent, you can still get saved. And if you, did, if you don't say a prayer, you can still get saved. But I got saved off the... My biggest thing is I understand that part. But the falling away I'm seeing is, is people fall into sin. And in order to, in order to justify their sin, what do they got to do? Exactly. They got to put the Bible down. They'll try twisting scripture, and when enough people get onto them for twisting scripture, the truly saved, 
They go like this. Well, I just don't want to hear it then. And they fall away. They're no longer laboring for the Lord. And we have very few people out there, brethren, that are laboring for the Lord. And I'm not talking about being online, being in front of people, preaching and stuff like that. I'm talking about gospel tracts. I'm talking about doing good things with your hands that you can give God glory for, living right, living for the Lord, sanctifying your home, okay? Setting an example to the lost world, being a light. We're supposed to be a light to the world. Well, how are we a light? Because we have Jesus in us. And it's supposed to show by the actions what's, what we do around us, what we allow around us, what we do, what we say, it's all there. And people are falling away and they're falling into the flesh again, that old man, and they're like, well, I'm just going to put the Bible to the side. Or I'm going to twist scripture to make myself feel good about my sin. Okay. There should be more laborers than there are today. There really should. I believe there should. But we're in the last days, so the few that we have, the Lord's like, you know, Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. And I pray and I thank the Lord. I thank the Lord for King James Video Ministries. Brother Brian, when I got saved, he was seemed to be the only one. Even back then, you had all these people. Oh yeah, they're King James Bible believers, Sam Gipp. And you've got, they tried to get me to do Robert Breaker. For some reason, I just couldn't do Robert Breaker. I did Sam Gipp a little bit. But my main focus was King James Video Ministries. But my point is, is Brother Brian, I don't know if he hears this that much, but thank you for asking, answering the call. What do we read there? Therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers. He sent forth, Brother Brian, King James Video Ministries. I learned about the Bible version issue. I learned the true gospel. I got saved. I started sanctification. I started learning things that I've never been taught. And I see. When I... I'd have to say 15, 20 years of these Babel buildings. Why are there so few labors out there? Brothers and sisters of Christ, we're in the last days. Your joy needs to be in labor and we need to be doing work for the Lord. Whether it's something as simple as growing your own food so you can eat healthy and you can give God glory for it, all the way up to leaving gospel tracts places or if you even feel called to, making videos. I've known people that made one or two really good videos and that's all they did because God put it on their heart. They wanted to share this testimony. They wanted to share this study that God showed them. And they only put very few videos out. Praise the Lord. You don't have to be putting videos, 50 videos out every week. All right? Just get busy laboring for the Lord. But this, when it's talking about the harvest, it's actually talking about the gospel. But like I said, you can be a light by the life that you live. We need to be getting out there and handing out gospel tracts, laying gospel tracts places, holding people accountable to it. In these last days, it feels like nobody wants to get saved. It just does. But does that mean we use that as an excuse not to continue doing the work of the Lord and laboring? No, we're still supposed to get out there and, and preach the gospel. Ministry of Reconciliation. Turn to 1 Corinthians 3.8. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. And every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. How is that for joy? Right now at the judgment seat of Christ, I'm, I'm terrified because there's going to be so many things i got to answer to the Lord for that I did wrong as a Christian. But there's also some rewards coming from doing the work of the Lord. But his own labor. Okay? I can't try to say, well, you see... You see that man on the camera right there? I did this before in probably one of the other studies. You see that man? He's out there preaching the Word of God. Yeah, he can do it for me. No, I can't. Brother Brian at King James Video Ministries. Oh, he's out there preaching the gospel, and he's preaching the major doctrines, and he's standing for the Word, and he's taking all the hits. He can do that all for me. No, he can't. Same thing goes with Brother JT. Uh, anybody else that's out there? I. You still have to be doing the work of the Lord yourself. And when you get to the judgment seat of Christ, the laboring that you're doing for the Lord, how much of it's going to be wood, hay, and stubble? I know my sins, a lot of the work is going to come up wood, hay, and stubble when I did sin, bad works. 
But how much works are you doing that's worthless and unfruitful and turn out to be sin and it's going to fall under there? You know, all those years I wasted on video games, movies, and TV shows, especially video games, hours and hours, days and days, all day playing games, wood, hay, and stubble. Every last bit of it. Not a single game, no matter how much you try to say, well, it makes me smarter or it helps me with this. It doesn't matter. Waste. You want to be smarter? You look at a man who had a major heat stroke in the military, turned into a seizure disorder, and I had a hard time remembering things and doing things. I, God saved me. I started reading this book, memorizing this book, living this book, and God has given me wisdom. You want to be smart? Here you go. Here's the answer. Jesus Christ and His perfect written word. Not some video game. People learn how to read, used to learn how to read from the King James Bible. That's how you taught kids to read. Turn to 1 Corinthians 4, 9. For I think, for I think that God hath set forth us, the apostles, last, as it were appointed to death, for we are made a spectacle unto the world, and unto angels, and to men. Notice how it said, appointed to death. That's why I've always said, this is a side note, that's why I always said that the twelve apostles, I think they all evidently, eventually ended up dying martyrs' death. Mm -hmm. I know it doesn't mention all of them. John's exiled to Patmos. What happens to John? Does he actually die of an old man there? It doesn't say. Okay. Verse 10, we are fools for Christ's sake, but ye are wise in Christ. We are weak, but ye are strong. Ye are honorable, but we are despised. Even unto this present hour we both hunger and thirst and are naked and are buffeted and have no certain dwelling place. And labor, working with our own hands. Being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we suffer it. Being defamed, we entreat. We are made as the filth of the world and are the outscouring of all things unto this day. What's this talking about? People who get in full-time ministry, mainly. Paul's talking about... I'm in full-time ministry. What does that mean? My face is out there. I have a bullseye on my face. I'm upsetting people by preaching truth everywhere I go. Okay. But the key there for what we're talking about today is labor working with our own hands. You should have work of your own hands for the Lord. I've come across so many people and it's when I was newly saved, that's when it started opening my eyes. I started talking to people, and they're like, well, I don't feel it's, I'm called um, into the ministry to preach the gospel. I mean, some people might be called into preaching the gospel. I just don't feel like I'm called to do that. And as I started learning from the Bible, I'm like, wait a second. We're all called into that. We all are. We're all supposed to be working with our hands. Oh, no, no, I just pay money to this Babel building, and they preach the gospel for me. Uh, no, you're supposed to be doing it yourself. Amen. I put down here, working full-time ministry is hard. The bullseye is right on us. But every Christian today should feel some of this. Some of it. You might not be in full-time ministry, but you're going to feel some of it, whether it comes from family members, neighbors, friends that you lose because you get saved, and you just start saying, you know what, I'm going to labor and do good things with my hand. Hey, buddy, why don't you come over and watch the football game? We got the beer and we got the pizza. Sorry, I don't do that anymore. Okay? I just don't do that anymore. Uh, you're going to lose friends. You're going to get people treating you the way that they talked about right here. Okay. But always remember, it's a blessing to be persecuted by the for the Lord, for Jesus' name. P uh, Peter, and I forgot who was with them, they were both rejoicing for being beaten in Jesus' name. 1 Corinthians 15.10 But by the grace of God I am what I am, and His grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain but I labored more abundantly than they all yet not I but the grace of God which was with me and this is where I put down Philippians 4 13 I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me brothers and sisters of Christ with my condition physical condition because I didn't take care of myself I look at this backyard and I still thank the Lord every time almost Lord I couldn't have done this without you chicken coop 
days that I go fishing, I get back and I make it back alive. Lord, thank you. And remember, it's the grace of God which is in us that allows us to do good things with our hands and give us joy in what we do. Not fleshly fun, fun in what we do. Joy, peace, good things. Okay. One of the songs I remember reading is, uh, When you do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me, to God be the glory. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. That old hymn. Okay. God gets the glory. And everything, all my laboring and everything I do, I give God the glory for it. I couldn't do it without him. Okay. I wouldn't have that joy that I have and that peace that I have without Jesus Christ. I wouldn't have the rest that I have today without Jesus Christ. Okay. Turn to Philippians chapter 2, verse 16. Holding forth the word of life that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. There's another thing there. Okay, We need to be careful. There's times where we feel like us in ministry, we're trying to preach the truth like I'm preaching right now. And I might get people that make comments that attack it. I get people that make comments that say, Amen, brother, and you look at their channel, and you look at everything they're subscribed to, and they're subscribed to almost anything and everything. And sometimes we're like, we feel like our labor is in vain, those of us who get into full-time ministry. But then comes around a brother in Christ that comes on and goes, what about this verse? It applies to what you're saying. Or they'll say, thank you, that was on my heart. I was reading the scriptures and some of the verses you came up with, I'd just gone through recently, and the Lord was speaking to me the same. And we let, get told that, hey, it helps us know that our labor isn't in vain. So it's taking some time to labor with your hands and leave some comments under people's ministries. It's a good thing. Let them know that their labor is not in vain. The biggest thing, um, I didn't do a study, I was thinking about it, but uh, casting your pearls before swine. You know, how sometimes you got to be careful. That has to do with who you're talking to. That comes to me. It has nothing to do with the audience. It has to do with me. If I feel like I'm casting pearls before swine, I have to watch who am I addressing. Who am I talking to? Am I talking to the swine? Am I talking to the sow walling in the mire? The dog returned to his own vomit? Or am I talking to sheep? Feed the house of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Am I talking to saved sinners? Then I need to make sure I'm addressing saved sinners. If somebody else watches this video, hopefully they get to the uh, pointed to the gospel message and they get saved. But this is to encourage the brethren. Okay, our laboring is where we're supposed to find our joy. Okay, we get joy from our the fruits of our labor and from our labor sometimes because sometimes labor is going to be really joyful at the beginning. Sometimes it's the fruit at the end that's where the joy comes in. Right? I got finished uh, cutting and trimming the hillside, the pass. On the right side and the left, the bushes are trying to grow in. That wasn't fun. I, it was a nightmare. I even got scratches. Should have worn a long sleeve shirt, but it's so hot out here. But when I go for walks down the, the hillside, it's like I'm walking in the forest. Like I'm already out here on the mountainside, but you know what I'm saying? It's like you're walking, you don't see the house, you don't see nothing. It's just like you're out in the forest area and you're walking and talking with the Lord and it's an amazing thing. That's the fruit of me clearing those paths. There's good things. And I'll say this one, we're gonna to get to this last verse. So turn to 1 Corinthians 15, 58 and we're gonna wrap it up. But I have to say this, brothers and sisters of Christ, how many of you can attest to it? And say it in the comment sections. How many of you can attest to at the end of the day when you've worked really hard and you sit outside? I don't know how many of you do it, but I do it, and I always encourage the brethren to do it. If you've got a place in the back patio or something that you've made your own, put some plants here and there, have a seat where you can watch the sun go down or something. When I sit out there in the evenings on the deck, after working a hard day's work and I'm sitting there and I'm like, oh Lord, and I'm able to talk to the Lord, I just feel good, joy, peace. I get to sit down and your body's resting, your whole body's saying, yes, you get to sit down, you know, you've been up all day on your feet. And it feels so much better than it did when I was just sitting around doing nothing. 
especially when I sit around and play video games. It wasn't the same. When I, when I get lazy and don't do anything, it's not the same. You don't have that same feeling. It's not that same good feeling of rest and joy at the end of a hard day's work. Well, it's just something I wanted to throw in there. It's just, for me, it just doesn't feel the same. If I've done nothing and played around, played around, flesh, sin, it's not the same. Okay. Turn to 1 Corinthians 15, 58. I'll leave you with this verse. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And I want to leave you with that verse. So, grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all, and my love for you in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching.